having reviewed many of the central ideas of those first two inference lectures, we want to now turn our attention to looking at our native capacity to formulate and to evaluate deductive inferences. In other words, our intuitive capacity to formulate or evaluate such inferences. And the first thing that we'll look at is the role that working memory plays even in our intuitive formulation and evaluation of deductive inferences. And as a result, the limitations it places even on our native capacity to formulate and evaluate such inferences. Then we'll turn our attention to that other important property of system one inference strategies, namely contextualization. And we'll see that our native deductive inference capacity is highly contextualized, that the information that drives our formulation and our evaluation of deductive inferences is disproportionately skewed towards their content and the context in which we come across these inferences. And as a result, what we'll see is there are a number of content effects or biases that emerge in our native capacity and even context effects or biases that emerge in our native capacity. Once we've discussed our native ability to formulate and evaluate deductive inferences, then we'll turn our attention to that other class of inference strategies that are included in that system one category, namely context dependent inference strategies. And we'll talk a little bit about context dependent conditional or deductive inference strategies. And then we'll look at probabilistic ones as well. To get a sense of our innate native capacity to formulate and evaluate deductive inferences, let's just look at a few examples of deductive inferences and try and come to an evaluative judgment about whether or not they are valid or invalid. Now, these concepts are concepts that we'll introduce and will play an important role in the next module of the class. But we can understand them right now for the purposes of this illustration as follows. A valid deductive inference is one where if the initial information is true, then the information that results from that inferential transformation also has to be true. So a valid deductive inference, it succeeds in preserving truth through the inferential transformation. An invalid deductive inference then is one where they, it potentially fails to preserve truth across that inferential transformation. And we want to make judgments about these individual inferences on those lines. So let's take a look at the first one here. Bob is tall. It's not the case that both it's not the case that Tony is fat and Bob is tall. Conclusion, Tony is fat. Now you might want to pause the video for a second, think about it, try and decide, is this a valid or an invalid deductive inference? That is, if those first two sentences are true, will it guarantee the third sentence is also true or not? So go ahead and decide about that. Let's take a look at a second one here. Sue is a rocket scientist, just in case it's false that Ginger is both short and not short. Ginger is a rocket scientist. Conclusion, Sue is a rocket scientist. Again, you can pause the video if you want, make an evaluation in your own mind. Try and make a judgment about whether or not this is a valid deductive inference. That is, if those first two sentences are true, does it mean that the conclusion, that third sentence has to be true as well or not? Finally, let's look at one more. Wallace confuses Greg. Wallace doesn't confuse Greg. Conclusion, Wallace is God. Now you probably don't even need to stop the video to come to an intuitive judgment about this particular argument. You'll look at this argument and go, the conclusion is beyond false, it's absurd. So clearly this is a terrible argument. Now the interesting thing about these arguments is that from a logical perspective, they're all good arguments. And they're good arguments because of their underlying structural relationships. And specifically, their underlying structural relationships are such that 
If those first two sentences in each of these arguments are in fact true, then the conclusion absolutely has to be true. And so they preserve truth, but it's not obvious or clear, particularly in that third one, that this is a property of these arguments because we're not sensitive to that underlying structural relationship. It's opaque to us. Instead, we look at the content, and particularly in that last argument, that conclusion just seems clearly and obviously false, and so the argument can't possibly be good. And I remember the first time I came across this particular type of argument, sometimes called a reductio ad absurdum, or reduction from absurdity argument. And the argument works by drawing out a contradiction, that is, showing that there are two statements that can't possibly both be true, and concluding on the basis of that contradiction that something else has to be true. Usually, it is the denial of one of the two contradictory statements, but there's nothing about the inference rule that guarantees that. And when I first came across an example of this, I was, I don't know, physically upset by the professor's assertion that this was a valid argument. This seemed, oh, this can't be a good argument. But the professor explained to me, ah, oh, but see, here's the relationship that's important here. It isn't whether or not the conclusion is true or even whether the premises are true. What's important in evaluating this argument is the relationship between the premises being true. If they were true, what could we conclude from the conclusion? And in this case, with that last argument, our premises can't ever be true. They're a contradiction. So if the impossible is possible, well, then even Wallace could be God under those circumstances. But the impossible is never actual, and hence Wallace is never God. And so it is a valid argument. If the premises were true, anything goes, the conclusion could be true as well. The premises just could never be true. And that's why it is that our intuitive capacity for formulating and evaluating deductive arguments really isn't perfectly in sync with those underlying structural relationships. And hence, we make systematic errors in our formulation and our evaluation of deductive arguments within the context of our system one inference strategies. Even setting aside that strange and perhaps incomprehensible last argument, what you probably noticed when you were going through these arguments is that they might have varied in terms of how intuitive they were to you, whether or not the argument was good or bad, that judgment came more easily or with greater difficulty from one argument to the next argument, or they might have seemed quite hard to you, all of them. And so we want to start to break apart our native deductive capacities and see why it is that we have difficulties and when we have difficulties in our native capacity for making and evaluating these deductive inferences. And we'll do that in our next lecture module.